Thought we'd surprise you and I'd become the guest lecturer. <laughs> Not really. Uh, Dr. Laklama, who was just before us, of course, isn't a stranger to the Apologetics Forum at all. He is going to be our presenter tonight, but he is also the one who has been the prime mover in putting the Apologetics Forum together, scheduling the speakers and doing so much with the website and everything else, and we're so thankful for that. Just a word about Dr. Laklama. Again, he has earned a degree in nuclear physics, worked in the telecommunications and computer software industries for over 40 years, certainly has taught Bible in his home congregation as well as many other places. Uh, he developed a series of lectures on creation versus evolution and Christian apologetics over the years, and those presentations have been presented in many different settings, not only Sunday school classes, but also to college students during church services at Bible schools and then also in other countries in Europe, Asia, Africa, and North America. And we're looking forward to this presentation this evening as well, answering the new atheists. So let's welcome Dr. Laklama. Well, thank you. The, um, topic at hand, we're going to address what some of the, what we call the new atheists are saying about our beliefs. And we call them new atheists, but uh, you'll see they're not much different from the old atheists. They're just a little bit more aggressive than uh, we're used to. Um, and you ask the question, well, what are they so aggressive about? What are they so angry about? If God doesn't exist in their mind, why are they attacking him? Answer that one. Well, just to introduce the topic, you know, I'm going to talk a little bit about what do we mean by the new atheism. And uh, these four people displayed here are well known uh, by the books they have written, particularly Richard Dawkins, probably the most well-known atheist in the world at this point, and uh, evolutionist uh, to boot. And they're called the Four Horsemen. You might wonder why the four horsemen. Well, you know about the four horsemen from the apocalypse in the uh, book of Revelation, and uh, here they are. So we're going to just introduce their book shortly, and, uh, and then talk about how do we respond to what they've written. And uh, they make a number of very bold claims, and uh, we don't have time to go over all of them here, but I've chosen eight of them, and uh, listed here, I'm not going to read them here, uh, and then go through them one at a time, and how would we answer the claims that they make? That's the topic of this uh, uh, lecture, and then draw some conclusions to that. I've shown two books up here, uh, side by side. Uh, God is Not Great, that's the one written by Christopher Hitchens, the atheist. Well, who's this guy, Peter Hitchens? He wrote a, go a book called The Rage Against God. Turns out, this is Christopher's brother. So you can imagine they've had some very interesting discussions around the kitchen table, discussing who's right. Uh, Christopher Hitchens, uh, as you probably know, is no longer with us, so he knows the truth at this point. But we're going to deal with what he said uh, while he was still with us. So briefly, uh, we call the New Atheists the writers of the 21st century. They've written probably a dozen books between the, the four of them there. And that what they claim is that religion is just based on blind faith. In other words, what you and I believe is just blind faith. We have no evidence for the truth that is in us. And moreover, as Hitchens says, religion spoils everything. They believe that religion, uh, religion should not be tolerated, it should be criticized wherever they can, and it should be exposed by them making so-called rational arguments. And they say science has advanced so far that uh, the existence of God uh, has been proven not to be. He just doesn't exist, as if science could prove that. But that's what they say, and we'll talk about that. Some of the principles of the new atheism, they say all faith is folly. You know, not just our Christian faith is folly, but all the religions of the world, you know, what these people believe, that's just foolishness. But you'll notice they're, they're not talking Hinduism or Buddhism or even Mormonism. 
they're, they're, attacking, they're attacking our belief, our faith, the Christian faith. And that's what you have to keep in mind. They said, you know, we people need to, or people of the world, we need to stop giving religion any special treatment. They say the Bible offers no answers to some of the hard questions of life, including suffering. Uh, they say religion is not the source of morality that we live by. Uh, the universe that we live in is nothing but matter. You know, mind doesn't exist. It's just a product of matter, is what they would say. Uh, atheism is growing and coming out of the closet. And they said, moreover, godless societies are a lot happier than we are as believers. So why do you believe in God? Well, here's the four horsemen. I'm not going to give you a lot of history about these four but just to say the two that I'm going to speak the most about are the two on the left, Richard Dawkins, who's probably the most popular atheist in the world at this point, most uh, well-known, and then Christopher Hitchens, who wrote a number of books and uh, was a very rabid atheist, and he is, as I said, no longer with us. Here's some of the books they wrote. These five are some of the first ones. Sam Harris started out uh, writing a book called The End of Faith, in other words, faith should be no more, he would say. And he wrote another book called Letter to a Christian Nation, saying, you know, we Christians in this nation, here's what you got wrong. And then the, probably the most famous book is The God Delusion, written by Richard Dawkins in 2006. He said, w if you believe in God, you've been deluded. You know, you're just deluded. It's, just, just a, it's a matter of mind over matter. And then uh, another one written by Hitchens, God is not great. And that's the one I, I showed before. God is not great. Christopher Hitchens, you know, it's the word God, lowercase, small letters, you can hardly read it. And of course, that's his opinion of God. And so those are probably the five most famous books that they have written. Although there's been some later ones, which I don't cover in this particular lecture. What do other atheists have to say about some of the books written by these atheists, particularly the books written by Dawkins? Michael Roos, who's also an atheist and believes in Darwinism, neo-Darwinianism, he says he read that book, The God Delusion. He said, it makes me embarrassed to be an atheist. And what he's saying there really is that, Mr. Dawkins, you're not really making uh, believable arguments. They don't make rational sense to me. And so he's embarrassed to be an atheist when he reads Dawkins' book. Uh, Thomas Nagel, another atheist, has uh, this to, to say. Since Dawkins aims to overturn the convention of respect towards religion that belongs to the etiquette of modern civilization, he resorts to persistently violating the convention and being as offensive as possible. In other words, if you can't attack his point, if you can't attack uh, um, what I believe, then he attacks the person. And that's what that means. Mr. Orr, another evolutionist, says the disappointing feature of the God delusion is Dawkins' failure to engage religious thought in any serious way. And so his arguments really don't make any sense because he doesn't even understand the Christian uh, belief system and he mischaracterizes it and then attacks the mischaracterized description that he gives it. So it, it's really not very rational in his mind. Now, fortunately, there have been some Christians who have written some responses to these uh, claims made by those atheists. Uh, Doug Wilson here in Idaho has written a number of books uh, and answering uh, Hitchens for one, Letter from a Christian uh, a Citizen, uh, God Is, How Christianity Explains Everything, and then uh, back at Dawkins, The Deluded Atheist. You know, it's not we the ones that are deluded, it's Dawkins, you are the one that are deluded. And Joel McDermott wrote another one on the village atheist, and then John Lennox, who happens to be a mathematician and a professor at Oxford University in London, and that's where Dawkins is from. Dawkins is a biologist, and uh, he was also a professor at Oxford University. So they're colleagues, and they have some very brilliant uh, debates between the two of them. And I really appreciate what uh, Lennox has to say. He's written a number of books refuting the beliefs of these uh, uh, atheists, and uh, he makes a lot of sense in a lot of cases. So then we're going to step through these claims that the new atheists make. I'm going to go through them one by one. 
I'm not going to read the eight here. I'll come to the titles when we, when we get to them. The first one, claim number one. You've heard it said before. You know, what you believe as a Christian, that's just blind faith. You, know, you don't have any evidence that your faith is real or based on reality. Uh, they would say that science alone is rational and has lots of evidence. Religious faith is blind, irrational, and there is no evidence for the truth of the gospel. Scientists, they, they say, use reason. Science is evidence-based. And they would say, you religious people, you've thrown away reason. Your faith is blind. And your faith is belief without any evidence to back it up. That's what they say. So how do we address that? Well, first of all, they mischaracterize the nature of faith. You know, our faith is not blind. You know, we have many lectures, uh, different people have given, uh, apologists have given, given uh, uh, evidence for the truth of our faith. You know, we take the Bible as God's word, yes, uh, that is our bias. We take it as inerrant uh, in its original form, and uh, we take it as true history. But what evidence do we have for that? Lots, turns out. Look at archaeology. Look at all the finds, thousands of finds. Nothing has been found that disagrees with what the Bible uh, records. History, even secular history recorded. You know, the Bible is very, very accurate in historical events. Um, prophecy. There is no religious book that has prophecy the way the Bible has it. You know about the messianic prophecies, but do you know the fact that there are a thousand prophecies in the book, the Old Testament, the New Testament. About half of them have already been fulfilled, hundred in the coming, in Christ's first coming, the coming of the Messiah, and others yet to be fulfilled in the second coming. There is no book that comes anywhere close, and I could go on and on about that. That's another lecture in itself. But we do have the evidence. We do have the evidence for the truth. We had a speaker here a few months back who is, was a, uh, an ex-Mormon, and uh, he, he can take, and he is now a believer, uh, we can look at the Mormon faith, what the Book of Mormon says, look at the archaeology, saying where's that hill of Mormon, where's those gold plates, where did the Nephites come from, the people, none of that, there's no evidence for any of that. We don't have that in our Bible, our Bible is true. Uh, we say that faith and reason are not mutually exclusive. There are many verses in the Bible I can quote, says we can reason among ourselves, we can use reason. We were created in God's image and we can use logic and we can show the evidence. Um, and moreover, they would characterize that what we have is a conflict between science and religion. You, you've heard it said, well, science disproves the truth of the Christian religion. No, it's not science versus religion, it's a conflict between two different worldviews, between naturalism, which says materialism is all that there is, just material, and supernaturalism, which means, yes, there is also supernaturalism, and God is supernatural. God and science are not alternatives, explanations for reality. Um, you know, if there's one reality, they have to agree with each other. So there, it's a conflict between two different worldview. The question is not, we're not asking the question, is Christianity true? You know, we can show that the evidence shows that it's true. It's not, is it helpful? You know, if you become a believer and you say, oh great, my life is, uh, you know, 100% joy now. And your friend says, I became a believer and uh, that didn't happen to me. That's not what Christianity, the truth of Christianity is about. It, uh, the question we have to ask is science fit into this? And I also always like to ask the question, my Christian apologetics class, does what you believe to be true, in other words, you believe the Bible to be true, you believe that God exists, does that match reality? That's the question. So what arguments do they use? First of all, the materialist view. They would say science is based on evidence, faith is where there is no evidence. Rational versus irrational arguments. Science deals with reality. Faith deals with everything else. That's how they would characterize it. But we as believers say the Christian view is no. Faith and science are not separate. 
If God is the creator of this world, then what we see must match what is written in his word. So special revelation and general revelation have to match. And if God created the universe, he created the laws of nature. And in fact, you can see that science is only possible because the laws of nature work and they're fixed. Imagine if you're a scientist and you try to measure um, something, gravity for example, and it changed from day to day. How would you do science? You couldn't. We can do science because the laws of nature are fixed. Because God is the creator, he created those laws. And that makes science possible. Science and faith, Christianity that is, are complementary to each other. Special revelation, general revelation agree with each other. There are some things we may not understand yet, but the more science finds out and is finding out these days, the more we find that the Bible is true in what it says scientifically. Second claim, they say atheism is not a religion. Well, atheists have faith too. They believe in something. They don't believe that God exists. Um, they, but they, they will say that uh, you know, religion, we Christians, we believe what we believe blindly. It's not evidence-based, it's just belief in God. Atheism says it is evidence-based. God does not exist. Nature is all there is. That's what they say. So how do we answer that? Um, first of all, look at the dictionary definition. Religion is a set of beliefs and practices generally agreed upon by a number of persons or sects. You know, different sects have different belief systems. Everybody believes something. You know, nobody just believes in nothingness. And even the U.S. Supreme Court in 1961 said secular humanism, uh, that, which is a form of atheism, is considered a religion. Yes, it's not theistic re uh, religion, but it is a religion. Even the Human Manifesto of 1933 uh, defined secular humanism as a religion. So they can't refute the fact that they have a belief system. They do have a religion. Everybody is religious. You know, if all there is is material and natural causes and nature, that's all there is, then how do you explain th emotions like love, hope, and joy? Atheism tries to explain everything by means of physical causes. You know, what you're thinking is just your brain waves, you know, in your head. But don't forget, uh, Darwinism believes in random uh, motions. So if you come out with a thought and you say randomness and material is all there is, how can I believe what you're saying if it's just random thought? It just doesn't make sense. So the, the, the real question, is my religion confirmed or refuted by the evidence that we have? God did leave evidence for us. And in his word, he also says in Romans chapter 1, verses 18 to 22, that uh, everything that you see is made of things that you don't see, things that are invisible, and everybody can see that there is design in the nature that we live in. I mean, it just didn't happen randomly. Uh, Romans 1 tells us that. And Romans 2.15 tells us that God gave us a conscience. So we know what is right. We know what is wrong. Atheists know what is right and what is wrong. So there's no excuse for atheists to believe that there is no God. We are without excuse. Third claim. They say, well, science has disproved God. Well, how can science disprove God. God is invisible for one thing. You can't see him. So there's no way of measuring his uh, existence. But they would say evolution explains everything. Uh, in fact, the, the three big things that people deal with is the origin of the universe itself, the origin of first life, where did the first living cell come from, and then the origin of more complex living things. And that, of course, involves Darwinism. And they would say, well, evolution can explain all of that. And I can, I can show you from science point of view that it can explain none of that. There is no good science behind that. But they, they claim that eventually they'll find the reason 
and how things were created, how things started. And then eventually, we, we don't need God to explain that anymore. They said there's no scientific evidence, um, so there's no need for God to explain that. Richard Dawkins would be so bold as to say God almost certainly does not exist. Darwinian natural selection explains the illusion of design in living things. In fact, he makes statements like, uh, every time we look at something that appears to be designed, we have to remember that's an illusion. That's not really designed. And uh, it just looks like it's designed. So th they, they argue their way around it, but science is very clear that there are th things that cannot happen by chance. It's just impossible. Um, they, they say the universe that we live in, you know, we know, scientists know that it is fine-tuned. There are probably about 500 physical constants which are exactly what they need to be in order to support life in this universe. And they, and they will make the bold argument, say, well, we are one of many universes. There are 10 to the power of 500 universes out there. We just happen to be lucky and live in the one that can support life. Now, from a science point of view, you have no way of measuring anything in any other universe than our own universe. So it's conjecture on their part. It's not science. Um, okay, let me step to the next one just here. You've all seen uh, Mount Rushmore, this picture here. Every phenomena uh, that you, you see in nature can be explained by one of three ways. Either it came about by chance, or there's some physical law which requires it to come. In other words, if I step off uh, this platform here, raise my foot across, which way am I going? Up or down? Down, because the law of gravity will always make me go down. And so that's a law. And the third is, well, if it, if it can't happen by chance, and there's no law which is it might, must happen this way. The only other explanation is it was designed. Somebody designed it. Even take this, uh, one of these simple chairs here. You know, if I told you, well, stuff fell out of the ceiling and it, it just happened to f fall in place and, and formed a chair that I can sit in safely, would you trust it to sit in that chair? I don't think so. It, it can't happen by chance, even a simple chair. And it can't happen by a law. Therefore, somebody designed that chair and some craftsman built that chair. There was design involved. Everything you look at in the world has to be explained by one of those three things. So keep that in mind. So science is limited. You know, yes, we can use science to determine some truth. We all have five senses that we use. And uh, we can determine a lot of things about the, our surroundings here. Uh, but there are... There are uh, limits to that. Oops, sorry. Um, first of all, our senses have to be reliable. I mean, if, if you can't measure carefully, then uh, th it doesn't help you much. Science presupposes that truth is real. You know, we live in a real world. Some people would say that what we, are, uh, what we live in is uh, a virtual world, imaginary. I mean, you're just imagining. What you, where you live, but no, it's real. Science cannot deal with things like moral laws, uh, concepts of truth, or meaning in life. So science is limited in the truths that can be revealed uh, through it. Um, one point here about what Dawkins has to say about his arguments. Um, first of all, you know, he doesn't allow supernatural explanations for anything that we see. In other words, a priori said you can't con consider God uh, to explain what you see there. So everything has to be explained by natural phenomena. So if that's so, then how do you know what's true? If reason, as I said, the, our brain waves are just random formations or random movements of our, our brain, then, and just happened by chance, how can I trust what somebody is telling me? You know, there's no basis for faith uh, in human reason then. 
um, be, because there's no logic involved in that. So already they are using Christian truth concepts to make their arguments. They can't make their arguments without using some of the truth of the Christian uh, beliefs. The other thing we have to keep in mind is when we look at science and faith, uh, three things. If we're doing something in the present, you know, the scientific method, you're measuring something, you ask your friend to measure the same thing, and you run the experiment again, you always get the same result. It's repeatable and it's observable. That's science. However, if something happened in the past, uh, it's an event in the past, but there was somebody to observe it and it was recorded, there was an eyewitness or hopefully more than one eyewitness to record that event, that's history. If something happened in the past that is obviously not repeatable and there were no eyewitnesses, then it's not history, not, uh, it's just a belief system. And you know, we take God as the author of the Bible and God was present uh, when he created, of course, that is our eyewitness. Uh, evolution, the start of the universe, nobody was there to observe that. If there was a big bang, nobody was there to record that and to see it. Um, that's a belief system. So we have to realize, atheists have to realize, we're all dealing with belief systems. When we talk about origins, it's belief. You know, there is no science which can prove uh, the beginning. Claim number four, uh, there's no evidence for God, they would say. Belief in God is irrational, superstitious, pre-scientific. And naturalism, which is the atheist scientist view, uh, it precludes any supernatural explanation for things. You know, we can't use God to explain uh, what we see there. Um, evolution does not need God, they said. Evolution can happen, you know, it happens by chance, you know, mutations and natural selection and, you know, here we are. That's how we got here, is what the atheist would say. However, when you talk with an atheist, you often, since they can't address your claims, your counterclaims to what they're saying, they would often come on the offense and attack the messenger as opposed to what the messenger is saying because they can't answer the messenger, you know. When I show them science does not prove evolution, when I, I say uh, there's no evidence that we evolved from some ape-like creature, I'll ask them the question, show me one fossil that proves that we came from some ape-like creature. Well, they'll say, go to the museum. You know, there's thousands of samples, thousands of fossils that you can see. No, I said, just name me one, name me one and they can't because all the ones that they have named over the last few hundred years they have now all been debunked and shown not to be true intermediate fossils and uh, you know lucy is probably their biggest one for the last 30 years and the reason they haven't come up with another credible one is there is none but they hang on to lucy because that's all they have and yet you know we can show scientifically there is no link between an ape-like creature and man at all. So how do we answer no evidence for God? Now we have to admit we can't prove scientifically that God exists. Nobody can prove that. However, there are some classical arguments that have been used over the ages to show that uh, God does exist. And uh, there's really two categories I want to go through here quickly. One is the classical arguments, which have been, have been used by philosophers. And then the second one, what best explains what we observe today? Is that explained best by theism, that is belief in God, or is it best explained by a lack of, you know, that God doesn't exist, atheism that is. So uh, just, yeah, one book up top there by Anthony Flew, he's a, a British philosopher, no longer with us, but for 50 years he was an atheist, just like Bertrand Russell uh, in, uh, in England. He wrote a book called There Is No God. He was convinced there is no God. Well, the last 10 years he looked at uh, 
arguments are made by intelligent design people and it's, w who claim that there's no way we can have what we have without a designer behind it, and that designer is probably God. He came to belief, I'm not sure he came to a fully Christian belief, but at least he believes that God exists, and he wrote a new book called There Is a God. Just change the word no to a, there is a God. I found that a very important uh, and interesting turnaround. So, arguments for God exist. First of all, the beginning of, there is a beginning to the universe. Scientists now agree for the last hundred years that our universe does have a beginning. It isn't just, it, it, it's not eternal. Like It hasn't always been there. And so that is an argument that uh, has convinced some people that there is a designer behind the universe uh, that we live in. Second, there is a design argument. If you look at the complexity of the, the universe that we live in, I mentioned the 500 physical constants, which are exactly what they need to be. You know, even the law of gravity, the one over R squared, the R squared is the 2.0000. You know, it's not 1.99 or 2.01. It has to be exactly 2.00, else the universe wouldn't hang together. And there's a whole bunch of constants like that, the weight of the proton, the weight of the neutron, etc., etc. They had to be exactly what they are or else life couldn't exist. That's called the anthropic principle. And that's where atheists come and say, well, we just got lucky and they're all, all the constants are uh, in our universe are correct, but there may be other universes which they're not. And then the design of life, which I won't go into here, but the complexity of the design of the human cell is such that could never ever happen by chance. It's mathematically impossible. And uh, we're actually, in August, the scientist is gonna speak here, he's gonna talk about that some more and show you that uh, mathematically it is impossible. So the design of life argument. Third, moral law argument. If there's a, such a thing as a moral law, which we believe there is, and, and God said in his word in Romans 2.15, that we're all given a conscience, we know what's right, we know what's wrong, a moral law implies that there must be a moral law giver. And so that's the third argument. And then fourth, the, what we call the ontological argument, the concept of God being the greatest conceivable and necessary being possible. And so those are four arguments that uh, philosophers have used over the ages and are still being used to show that there is good evidence for the existence of God. So then we come to these other um, pieces of evidence and ask the question, you know, first of all, the cosmological argument, uh, design, um, possibility of human knowledge, et cetera, et cetera. I'll walk through some of these. Um, if we look at that, is that best supported by belief in a God or is that best understood by believing that there is no such thing as God, that just God doesn't exist. So let's look at some of these. First of all, the cosmological argument again, uh, three premises, whatever began to exist must have a cause, okay? Uh, you know, there's a plate on the chair here and uh, it's not gonna just get up and fall off. Somebody has to cause that to fall off. Everything that you see, every effect, there's a cause. The universe began to exist. You know, that's an effect. There must be somebody that caused it to exist. And thus the universe had a cause. Premise one is the law of causality. Premise two, an example of that is the law of thermodynamics. Um, you know, we know from thermodynamics that the useful energy in the universe is running down. We don't have as much useful energy uh, as we used to have in the universe. And therefore, if that's true, if the universe was eternal, we would have run out of, out of useful energy by now. We wouldn't even exist. So it must have had a beginning. And that leads to the third premise, the universe came into existence by an eternal uncaused cause, and that being God. It can't be explained by chance, and therefore the existence of the universe is best explained by a theism. Uh, Second, the design and order found in the universe. And I've talked about this already. The mathematical probability of origin of life 
by chance is essentially zero. And the scientist that comes here in August will explain that in more detail. The amount of information about one single cell in the human body is thousands of encyclopedias long. That's how complicated it is. And then the anthropic principle. So the design of the universe, the design of life, is better explained by the existence of God than by atheism, which would assume that everything just happened by chance. We're just here because the mutations uh, you know, changed the, the nature of our, the genes in our body and eventually came to, you know, formed a, a useful organ in our body and then we, that's how we evolved, all by chance. That is not believable. Uh, Fourth, the possibility of human knowledge. How do we get knowledge? How do we gather knowledge? How do we do that if our brain is just a random thoughts, you know, random brain waves? How, how could you formulate knowledge uh, that could be useful to somebody? There's no way that atheism can bridge that gap. There's no way it can explain that. It can't evolve just from matter on its own. I mean, there, there's just no information in that matter. And uh, that's what life is all about. The only difference between life and non-life is life has information. Our cell contains information. The DNA in our cells, that's the information. That's the computer program in our cells. Without that, we would not have living material. Um, eternal truths. You know, we have certain unchangeable uh, eternal truths that we believe are true. Some people, you know, we live in an age of postmodernism. People would say, well, that may be true for you, but it's not true for me. In other words, it's just, uh, that's postmodern. Well, and he'll say, there's no such thing as an absolute truth. Then you ask him, is what you just said true? No, it's self-refuting. Uh, and the same thing with agnosticism. Uh, agnostic will say, I don't know if there's a God. I really don't know. Um, and, and again, agnosticism is self-refuting. How do you know? If you don't know everything, how can you know? Self-refuting. Mathematical truths are discovered. You know, for those of you that like math, you know, mathematical, ma math formulas can be beautiful and simple. How do they get to be that way? Why aren't they much more complex? But they really are uh, simple. So atheism really has no basis for any eternal truths. Moral laws. You know, we have moral laws that we live by. Ten Commandments, of course, straight from God's word. Uh, moral laws are prescriptive. They prescribe what we ought to do, what we should do. They don't prescribe what we actually do, but they describe what we should do. And this re requires a prescriber, just like a prescription that you get from a doctor. You know, that is written by a prescriber. The doctor writes that prescription. So the same with laws. Moral laws are written by moral law givers. Atheism has no basis for morality because if everything happens randomly, then we're gonna get laws that are bizarre and random. We already see that atheism, uh, by nature, atheists don't have any respect for human life. You know, they may respect human life because it's, it's useful in some cases, but they have no basis for that. Um, they would say man is no more value than an animal. I mean, we're just another animal. Same animals have rights. No basis for human rights. In theism, all men are created equal, and that is the basis for our human rights. God-given human rights, not man-given. Man changes over time, and we don't want the laws made by man. We want the laws uh, made by God. Um, existence of evil. How do atheists explain it? They can't explain the existence of evil. First of all, they can't define what's the difference between evil and good. You know, what's the difference between uh, what Mother Teresa did and what Hitler did? How do you define what's good and what's bad? They, they have no basis for doing that. But uh, the God of the Bible defines what's evil or what's good. 
and uh, the God of the Bible offers a solution for dealing with evil. Uh, human consciousness. When did man, if man evolved, when did he first become conscious and aware of himself that he is a living being? How did that happen? How did that evolve? What if you became conscious one moment and the next generation is not conscious? I mean, how, how does that work if it happens randomly? So human consciousness is best explained by theism. <clears throat> and then free will. Where does our free will come from? Where does our responsibility come from? If you're a materialist and all you believe in is n nature and material things, then where does your responsibility come from? Why should you care if you're responsible for anything? There's no basis, and, and we as theists have a basis for that. So evidence best supports theism. Atheism fails to explain human experience. Uh, atheists can't live a consistent life. They must live as if human life is sacred, uh, as if it has meaning. Um, because an atheist's beliefs are not rational. If they're random, how can they be rational? So theism explains human experience uh, much better than atheism uh, does. Okay, the next uh, claim number five. You've heard it. Uh, in fact, Hitchens wrote that book um, where he says, religion spoils everything. You know, God is not great. Religion spoils everything. All the problems in the world are because of religion. To atheists, atheism is not a religion. Um, all the world's wars are uh, due to v our violence and due to s religious beliefs. Every war can be explained that. The deaths that we see in the world, in wars, are, it can all be explained by Christians you know, having their religious wars. And they point to the Crusades, the Spanish Inquisition, Northern Ireland between the Catholics and the Protestant, uh, Rwanda, Sudan, the genocides that occurred there. And, uh, and then, moreover, they would say that any death and violence that we see in atheist countries, countries with atheist rulers, is not due to atheism. Atheist communists, yes, they murdered tens of millions of their own people, but they did that not because they were atheists, but they did that despite the fact that they were atheists. Nothing to do with what they believed, they would say. Well, well what is the truth behind that? First of all, we, we said atheism is a religion. It is a belief system. They do believe something. They do have faith in something. Uh, the government of every society is influenced by whatever worldview the leader has. Whether he's an atheist or a believer, it influences the government of that society. There's no way uh, not to have that happen. Power-hungry leaders force their worldview on their subjects, and we see that in the world today. All human governments are based on presuppositions of what's true. And I'll, I'll agree with what Hitchens says if you add the word false in front of religion. False religions spoil everything, and you include atheism in that. Atheism was the, uh, the, the last century, the 20th century, was the bloodiest century of all of human history. The most people were killed by conflicts in wars in the 20th century than all the centuries before it. And I'll show you some of the figures uh, in a bit here. Uh, the U.S. was founded on a Christian worldview. Men created in God's image. All men created equal. All men have God-given rights. Human life is sacred and it is to be protected. That's the foundation of our laws and our Bill of Rights. And the founders of the nation realized that human government is ruled by sinful men. So there needs to be some checks and balances put in our government to avoid sinful men doing harmful things. Limited power of government, that's what we have three branches of government, systems of checks and balances, and a rejection of a one world government. Okay, that just doesn't work. So that's the Christian worldview. What about atheism, secular humanism? Well, they believe that we should move towards a one-world socialistic government. There's no basis for the sanctity of human life. Man is the ultimate authority. And uh, so we don't need God. You know, we can set up our own government, man-made government. But then we have to obey the laws of men 
established by uh, sinful men. Um, picking one example, Margaret Sanger, you may know she's the founder of Planned Parenthood. And you know that most of the abortions in the U.S. are done by Planned Parenthood and other uh, abortionists. Uh, but most of them, I believe, are from Planned Parenthood. And here's Margaret Sanger, who is one of the founders. Uh, she even believed that inferior races should be exterminated. Why is that? Well, that helps evolution. Hitler tried to eliminate the Jews because he felt the Jews were an inferior, inferior race. Uh, Margaret Sanger said, uh, yep, no problem, just inferior races, let's just get rid of them. Uh, we're just helping evolution along, and that's what Hitler believed as well. Uh, and when you start down that road, of course, there's nothing stopping about you going into eugenics, abortion, even infanticide, the killing of the uh, freshly born babies, and uh, euthanasia of the elderly. Nothing to stop you at all. Uh, so evolution uh, and atheism naturally lead you into these evils. So let's look at the uh, deaths by atheist, atheist regimes in the 20th century. Some of these numbers may seem large to you, um, but if you look at the sum, you know, more than 200 million people killed in all the wars in the last century. 200 million. And the strange thing is many of those were killed by their own leaders, not by wars between you know, uh, Muslims and Christians or Protestant and Catholics. These were uh, definitive deaths by the leaders of these countries because the people uh, you know, didn't like their leaders and they were rebelling against their leaders. So they were eliminated. And uh, these were all atheist uh, leaders. That's just a fact of history. And then you, you come to other worldviews, and I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this, but just to, you know, you see the things that are happening over in the Middle East now. Um, you know, you've got a number of sects of Islam over there, and of course they're warring against each other, but they're also warring against uh, believers and anybody else that gets in their way. Anybody that doesn't come to belief in uh, Islam is eliminated. I mean, you see that happening in, in Iraq even today. And is that wrong? Well, if you read the Quran, uh, it calls for conquest by the sword. You know, there is no religious freedom even for non-Muslims. So this is according to their religion that they can do this. If somebody doesn't agree with what they believe, then they can be eliminated. Uh, other false religions, you know, polytheism, animism in, in, in uh, Africa and also South America uh, has resulted in many deaths. Uh, Hinduism, pantheism, reinc reincarnations, bad karma, you know, the whole caste system. And even in, in Europe, you know, Hitler was part of this, uh, the German folk religion. Pantheistic theology was involved here. Pantheism is, you know, God is in everything and we are just part of God. That's what they believe. And so that was just a folk religion that they believed. And uh, anybody that was non-German, non-Aryan, uh, was regarded as subhuman and therefore could be eliminated because we're trying to help evolution along. Well, coming back to these so-called Christian atrocities, did they happen? Yes, some of them happened. The Inquisition, Spanish Inquisition, killing and torturing of those opposed to the Pope, killing of Jews who would not convert. And uh, yeah, there were a few thousand deaths, um, you know, perhaps even more than that, 6,000. But that's not your 200 million, that's 6,000. The Crusades. Well, the Crusades were, you know, the Christian church defending against the invasion of the Muslim invaders, you know, in the uh, um, 11th, 12th, 13th century. And these actions were ordered by the Church of Rome, resulting in, I believe, more than one million deaths. Was that right? Was that justified? Some of it was not. Clearly, they were not acting as true Christians, as true believers. And we have to realize that even some so-called Christians, professing Christians, may not be genuine. And maybe what 
some of the, we have to admit some of the things they did were wrong. They were against what Christ commanded us to do. But these were not justified on the basis of commands given in the Bible to eliminate non-believers. Whereas in the Quran, you know, non-believers can be uh, eliminated. That's part of their belief system. Okay, n number six, evil disproves God. Um, as I said before, the fact that evil exists, how do atheists explain that? Okay, they said, well, if God created everything that exists, and if God is all loving and all powerful, then how, how come we have evil, pain, and suffering in the world? It shouldn't be. God is all loving. He can do whatever he wants. He can, have, he can create it all good. Well, uh, as you know, there is such a thing as uh, free will. You know, Adam and Eve were given the choice, and uh, they, uh, um, God did not create robots. You know, we are not to be robots, and uh, uh, we, we have a, a will. And then there's, there's uh, you know, four kinds of problems of evil that we could discuss here, but I don't have time to go into them. Uh, first of all, metaphysical, you know, evil created by an all-good God. How could God do that? Um, well, he didn't create it, but he allowed it. In giving men free will, it was allowed. It's not that he created it. Okay, so I'm going to... Um, just skip over this. You, by the way, all of these, the lecture that I give here, it'll all be up on the web, so you can go through some of this later on if you have an interest in uh, understanding some more of it. But the meta metaphysical problem of evil, that's how, does, how do we deal with God as the allowing evil, the possibility of evil. And by giving man free will, that possibility uh, existed. Um, but an atheist, um, you know, know there is such a thing as, as uh, 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 good and evil. They see that themselves. If somebody does them evil, they recognize that as evil. So they, they have to recognize that. Okay, then there's a moral problem, a physical problem, and the important thing is God deals with the problem of evil. God allowed his son to die on the cross for our sins, um, you know, for the, the sins that we ourselves could not pay for. And so God does have an answer uh, to evil. Atheists have no answer to evil. Can't explain why it's here, can't explain why it's different from good, and have no solution for that. There's no basis for calling anything evil. Uh, number seven, claim morality is not from God, they would say. There's no such thing as moral absolutes. Moral absolutes have no justification without God's existence. And moral laws are in a state of change, it's always changing. Um, compassion, it's, they would say, is based on evolution itself. Each person decides for himself what is right, and man is free to create his own values. There is no objective meaning to life. So there's no such thing as morality. Well, the answer is, in God's book, God does determine what is right, even atheists know evil when they are wrong. They do. They also appeal to some objective universal law to know what's right and wrong. Um, as I said before, how, how do you define, how would they define whether what Hitler did is wrong or whether what Mother Teresa did was wrong? You know, maybe what Mother Teresa was doing was, was evil. How do they know? So they, ca they can't appeal to a world or society consensus um, because there is no consensus on that. The absolute moral law is eternal and unchanging, points to a moral law giver. Can atheists, you know any atheists that are ethical? Yes. They're moral? Yes. Why is that? Well, God gave us each a conscience, so they can be moral. And then finally, belief in miracles. Um, they would say, and the atheists that, well, it's just superstition. It's not rational. Uh, they assume that miracles are impossible because they have to break some natural law for a miracle to, to happen uh, because they don't have a natural cause. They reject the Bible because of its claims of miracles. How do we answer that? Well, by definition, miracles supersede the laws of nature. Yes, they're not controlled by nature, 
but they are controlled by God, who is the designer of nature, of the natural laws. So God controls it all. And so God, if God created those laws, then he can also allow those laws to be um, set aside for his purposes. So the atheist is refuted by those uh, arguments. And then there, there's a number of other claims that we could go into here, but we don't have time to do that now. Uh, those eight, at some point I'm going to address them, but we're not going to do that here. So in conclusion, we see that the Christian faith is rational. It is evidence-based. It's not blind. We have lots of evidence for the truth of our belief. Atheism itself is a religion. New atheists, yep, they're more aggressive than the old atheists, but they offer no new evidence for their belief system. Science does not, and in fact cannot, disprove the existence of God. Science is, a pos is in fact possible to do because God is the creator. He did create the laws of science, and we can do science because of that. The three origins I mentioned before, all three of them require a designer, and that designer we believe is God. God designed and built the universe. God designed first life, the first living cell, and God designed all the complex life that we see within the living kinds that he said in chapter one of Genesis. And I've, you know, I said I agree with Hitchens and that he said uh, religions poison everything if you put the word false in front of it. False religions, yes, they do poison everything. But theism offers a more rational response than atheism for what we experience in this world. So the new atheist, yes, they're new, they're more rabid. In fact, you would call some of them evangelical atheist. They're very rabid about what they believe. And perhaps we need to be more rabid about what we believe and get the word out uh, as well uh, about what we believe to be true. So in summary, the new atheist don't have a case. I uh, thank you for your attention. So we're going to have time for a few. Questions. Yeah, we're going to have an opportunity for some questions now, and I have a microphone that I'm glad to bring to you. If there is someone who would be the first one with a question. And, and Rick. Yes. Do the plates as well. Yes. And maybe I can just mention at this time, I was uh, to receive an offering earlier before the presentation. We'll do that at the end of the Q&A here, just before we wrap up. Anyone? I was wondering, um, what, uh, what is your um, feeling on that movie, God is Not Dead, and uh, his argument? Thank you. Yeah, I've heard about that movie, but I did not watch it myself. And I've heard a lot of good things about that, uh, where I, I believe it's a student that argues with his professor uh, for the reality of uh, belief in God. Yeah, there, there's, while you bring up that topic, there's a bunch of DVDs out there as well. I've talked about them before. It's the one called, there's one called uh, Evolution versus God. And uh, it's where Ray Comfort goes around and, and asks people that believe in evolution, well, how do you prove it? And it turns out that they can't. And, it's, uh, and I think it's the same kind of uh, exchange between the professor and the student. Uh, Yeah, is there another question, someone? Wasn't sure if the little gal was raising her hands or not over there. But Anyone else a comment or a question? We're Rick, going to start Rick, the plates, Rick. too. And, uh, uh, um, and this is just if uh, you desire an opportunity to uh, give a little gift to... Yes, I'm going to get to her. Yeah. We have to have some speaking during the offering, so I'm saving our speaking. I was curious if you could put it put the slide back to the eight
things that um, the eight things that new atheists would say. The, the first eight. Yeah, the last. It was like two or three slides ago. It was right at the end. Oh, oh I mean the new the, ones. The end. Yeah, the end yeah, of the okay. presentation. Like one of them was about God, uh, teaching children about God is oh, bad, yeah. and there. Yeah. Okay, because I would, I would love to hear you respond to one of these. Let's see. Well, yeah, th this is a claim that's made by Richard Dawkins. He, he, and this is just the nature of this, uh, their approach. They said, we are teaching them falsehoods, and we, that's just like ab abusing a child. You're telling him mistruths, and you're teaching him mis mistruths. You shouldn't be doing that. We, sh we should take your children away and teach them in the... You know, in our state school system. Right. How, how would you respond to the, the God of the Bible is a despot? Um, yeah, the, that is, uh, again, they're claiming that there are some cases in the Old Testament particularly where God commands people to kill, you know, some of the nations, um, Israel in particular, to, to kill some people because they were evil and they were disobeying. And uh, the problem with that uh, claim is that they misquote the context, you know, why God is charging them to do that. And if you read the context, you know, there is a, a good cause for doing that. How does Richard Dawkins explain the information in a cell? Um, that's how he explained it. <laughs> it, it. He was asked by a believer, so all this information in the cell, you know, the DNA, where did that come from? And he hemmed and hawed for about a minute, and he said, that's, that's not a good question. He, he just could not answer it. And there's actually a video which captures his response to that. Very embarrassing. And it, later he wrote a response to that, but even his response was nonsensical. I mean, like I said, the only difference between uh, non-living matter and living matter is information. That's all. You know, and that information is in the DNA of our cell. It's not just the information, but it's also the computer programs. You know, as you know, when you know, all life starts from one cell, and that cell duplicates exactly, you know, the first cell, two and four and eight and sixteen and so on, and then all of a sudden, a few of them change into different kinds of cells. You know, our bodies have two different, two hundred different kinds of cells: skin cells, eye cells, bone cells. You know, all these different. What if the program? Uh, got the timing wrong and didn't create the bone cells at the right time. Yeah, you know, we wouldn't have the human body. It wouldn't be here. It is an exact program that knows exactly how to do it. And moreover, it is um, redundant. The programming is redundant. The information is redundant. So if there's a mutation in one of those uh, cells, then the other one can take over. I mean, the design is exquisite. Even Bill Gates, you know, admits that the program in the human cell is so much more complicated than the operating system running Windows on my computer here. And I'm reminded of that when I see the blue screen of death, that, uh, <laughs> that he didn't get a very good program there. I mean, the complexity of uh, MS Word and, and uh, you know, all the applications on top of that, very complex. But they crash, they hang. You know, fortunately, our body doesn't do, it, it does much better than that. I mean, 80, 90 years, and uh, yeah, we, we do pretty well. I had a Christian friend who really believed that the atonement was morally repellent. Can you respond to that for a few moments? Uh, yeah. Um, it just briefly, I mean, I just think, well, uh, Hitchens says, well, why would God do that? I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. They can't comprehend it. You know, the fact that somebody else would be sacrificing his life for the sins of uh, our sins. It well, just doesn't make sense. 
well, my friend who, who believed that, um, he felt like um, that that was a bloodthirstiness that God would require, a blood sacrifice yeah. for, you know, for, for this person's wrongdoing. Why yeah. would you punish this other person? Yeah, yeah and, and God is a just God. He demands that uh, we be righteous, and we, we can't be righteous on our own. And so Christ paid the penalty for us. Uh, had the situation where why did uh, why did a loving God kill his own son? You know, and uh, that, that's sort of a you know you look at that and uh, it uh, you you can see that whole system in the Old Testament. Yeah. And but the the rationale behind that is that Christ recognized that's what he was here for, and willfully went. To become the sacrifice for us, I love the uh, the word in Isaiah, where it says, uh, "We like sheep have all gone astray, and He sent, and, and and we've all gone our own way, and but Christ, but God laid His our iniquities upon His Son, and uh, what a what an amazing thing that just beyond the scope of imagination. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Would you put up your website up there so I can get a copy of it? Yeah, the, all the, um, the, the messages, the, the OSTA.com is my professional website, which kind of work I did. Messages has got all my messages that I've given over the last, uh, or at least most of them over the last six years or so, including the ones in different countries. And uh, gen general messages, uh, Message given in churches, sermons, what have you. Qu qu the courses that I do, also on there. Uh, one more, Rick. One more. One. Quick comment: When you were saying that the fossil, like all the fossils of all the Neanderthals and Lucy and all that such, was actually proved not to have proven human evolution from apes. My fr my first thought was, then why did they tell me that in school? Because I'm sorry, wh why didn't? That is what they told us in school. Well, they're they're not going to tell you in school that that doesn't prove evolution. They they told us it did. It, it was. It proves evolution, right? That's is, what they that's, said. Yeah. And in fact, I have a story from one uh, lecture I gave in uh, Bulgaria, and in Bulgaria, as you might know was a communist country and um, they, the, the teachers taught evolution in school. And I gave a lecture at a university which um, a retired uh, high school teacher, biology teacher, came to my uh, lecture and I, I, the uh, topic of my lecture was challenges to the theory of evolution. You know, here's why evolution is not true because science shows it to be false. And I went through you know, the uh, uh, fossil record and things like that. And he came up afterwards and said, you know, I, I'm sorry, but I taught all of my students false things. And he said, if you come back, could you give a lecture to uh, my students who are now teachers you know, at the schools where, uh, where he taught at? And I said, sure. So uh, I think it was two years later we came back and I got to speak to two different classes, and I, and I can't bring the Bible into it, but I said, here's the problem with the theory of evolution. And the first question I was asked in both cases by students, not the teacher, by the students was, so I, I see you don't believe in evolution, so how did we get here? That was a, an opening that, uh, of course, I took advantage of. <laughs> and uh, so they, they got it. And, and the, prof the teacher, the professor, actually came to belief later on because he realized that there's nothing, there's no science behind that at all. One last question. Hi, I'm, I have uh, several family members and friends that are atheists. And um, to me, that's in a way a great pri privilege to be a Christian in the midst of them and at the same time, it's a very difficult place. Um, 
I've read some books. Um, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist was a recent one I, I read. But I've noticed that you have a lot of um, resources and things like that up there, listed different books. It seems to me that this, so to speak, debate between atheism and Christian worldview is one that's pretty intense and has a lot of information um, to be known in order to really have a good conversation with somebody who's an atheist. My question is, if you were to condense this all down in simplified form, what would be something that you would give somebody as a tool to be able to reach out to these people in our lives and from an everyday standpoint or on occasion, where could I even start? Um, because some of them in my life even believe what I believe is offensive to them, very offensive. And yet my heart is so much to try to reach them and that's even why I'm here tonight is to be able to hear more about how can I reach them. It just seems yeah. there's so much information I don't even know where to begin. Yeah. Um, well, it, yes, there is a lot of information. And in fact, I, I told some folks already that I <clears throat> gave a lecture at the, the um, Seattle Creation Conference. And the, the topic was uh, New Atheist Pseudoscience. And what I show there from a science point of view is the fact that uh, evolutionists cannot explain the origin of the universe through the Big Bang. I mean, it's Science just does not support that. Um, atheist science can also not support the origin of first life, you know, the first cell. There's just no way. It's, it's a roadblock. You can't get over that hurdle. And it can't explain um, complex life forms at all. I mean, the neo-Darwinian evolution. There is just no science behind it. If you read, you know, one of Dawkins' books, uh, I don't think I have it listed here, um, it's called The Greatest Show on Earth. And uh, he said, here's the definitive proof that evolution is true. The definitive proof. So I read the book, and what does he say? Well, he can't explain how the first life came to be, but he says, oh, it probably could have happened this way. It might have happened this way. And the same thing with the transitions in evolution. You know, that, that um, Darwin was looking for to prove evolution. It, it, he just can't find the missing links because they were never there. They've always been missing. And, and so there are many good books like that. Um, well, I should say that's not a good book because it's not scientific. But then there's, there's one written by a Christian scientist called The Greatest Hoax on Earth. And he points out the flaws, you know, from science in Dawkins' book, The Greatest Show on Earth. Now, those are a little heavy to read, but, uh, and, and there's a lot more material. I mean, you look, look on my website, there's a lot of references to different books. And um, I've got a lending library if somebody's interested in, in reading some of those books. Uh, the list is on, on the website as well. And, uh, so, and I can talk to you later, too, about some other choices. Thank you so much for your participation tonight. Thank you, Dr. Leklama, also. Why don't we just show our appreciation? <laughs>